What's up everyone, welcome back to another What If video. For Dragon Ball Z movie characters, there are some characters that have some pretty cool backstories, and it would be pretty fun to see what it was like if they were in canon. I already did one with Turles, where his movie becomes canon and he actually turns good, so if you want to check out that What If, I'll link it at the top of this video. And Dragon Ball Super already included Broly, so I was thinking and seeing what other movie villains would fit in the story pretty well. Certain villains would probably fit well within canon, but they wouldn't change too much so it doesn't really make too much of an interesting topic for what if. But I did think of one that actually would completely change the world of Dragon Ball. And as you could probably tell by the title, I'm referring to Cooler. And I'm not talking about just making his movie canon, I mean just making Cooler an actual character in the universe. His movie kinda added him as an afterthought, but here we'll make him present as an actual character. One who's around for as long as Frieza was, as well as King Cold. Today, we'll be looking at what if Cooler was canon. For this video, I'm going to set a goal of 2500 likes. Be sure to click the like button so we can hit that goal, and once we hit it, I'll continue this what if with another part. Let's begin. We start far in the past, around the time when Frieza took over King Cold's army. This is where we'd start seeing some issues, and realistically, Cooler would definitely be involved here. With most pairs of siblings come sibling rivalry, but with Frieza and Cooler, it's not even rivalry, it's war. The two sons of King Cold have a power struggle competing to each be the favorite of their father in order to be the heirs of his throne. Frieza and Cooler are on the same side, but they don't particularly like each other. This isn't some normal sibling squabble. It's a contest to see who will get power over the universe. Ultimately, King Cold does make his decision. While Cooler may have just been trying to sound intimidating, he did mention before how he is harsher than his brother, and how Frieza is kinda soft. King Cold would definitely notice this. And while Frieza is a harsher ruler than him, Cooler is probably on a completely different level. Cooler may be stronger than his brother, but in terms of being a suitable fit for Emperor, Frieza becomes the heir to the throne. Understandably, Cooler doesn't like this decision one bit. Not wanting to be under command of his brother, or having to deal with his family anymore, Cooler decides to go off on his own. He'll become stronger than his brother and create his own empire, and take over the Frieza force one day. He essentially disowns his family and goes off on his own. He's just as power hungry as his brother, but he doesn't have any power handed to him like Frieza, and that just fuels the fire for his desire to conquer. His massive hate for the Frieza force keeps him going, and he begins building up his own power far away. In a completely opposite section of the galaxy, or probably even the universe, he'd be making his presence known away from the Frieza force. Alone, he is more than enough to take over some planets, and slowly, he starts growing a miniature squad of people that join him. He does find some stronger fighters, but not wanting a massive clan like the Frieza Force, he settles for a small group of people that he could trust, and who are all strong in their own right. Especially once he hears of the destruction of planet Vegeta, he knows that the Frieza Force is just a bunch of fodder soldiers. He won't need a massive army to take them down, just him and then a few other people. This leads to the creation of Cooler's Armored Squadron, a group of three fighters that follow Cooler's every orders. They're strong and loyal, exactly what Cooler was looking for. In his own outskirts of the galaxy, he continues his own conquest of terror. He does gain a little bit of influence and he is feared, but he still doesn't have the power of the Frieza Force. That is partially because he wants to lay low and wait for a time to strike them and then take over. He plans on somehow defeating his brother and usurping the throne, which will give him rule over the entire galaxy. Alongside his squad, and with some former inside information, he does spy on his brother's army, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Decades have passed since that last interaction with them. The year is age 762. Cooler is keeping tabs on his brother, and then he finds out something that might be the perfect opportunity for him. Somehow, there were some Saiyan survivors, one of them being Vegeta, the prince. From what he could tell, there was some other Saiyan on this planet called Earth, which Vegeta and his squad tried to come and take with them. But Cooler doesn't care about the specifics of that. The things he heard about Vegeta are more interesting, something that Frieza actually caught wind of. Apparently, there's this thing called Dragon Balls on Namek, something that was rumored to exist but no one actually knew for sure. On Earth, these things do exist because there are Namekians there for some reason, so that most likely means that planet Namek has Dragon Balls as well. It appears Frieza is heading there as well, after hearing this news from Vegeta when spying on him. It will take quite a bit of time to arrive on Namek, but Cooler and his squad decide to head out. Not only is this the perfect opportunity to face his brother, but he can also get these Dragon Balls and get some wish granted for him. They make preparations and head out. They are going to arrive a little bit later than everyone else though. In the meantime, let's actually switch over to Namek. As of now, things are going pretty normal. The Frieza Force has arrived in Namek, as well as Vegeta, and of course, the group of Bulma, Gohan, and Krillin. They all have the same goal, gather Namek's Dragon Balls and make their wish. Since Cooler's so far away, it does take some time for him to arrive on Namek. So we're actually going to fast forward a bit. 
a couple days actually. Let's say around the time that Piccolo fuses with Nail. Piccolo is in the midst of his fight with Frieza, and in the meantime, Goku is currently being healed in the healing chamber. It's amazing how strong Piccolo's gotten with this Namekian fusion, but is it actually enough to take on Frieza? Apparently not. Frieza does have other forms above his current one, and Frieza decides, why not show off his final form? He's surprised that these guys were able to draw it out of him, but he might as well give them a show before they all die. Frieza begins mutating into his final form. Seeing how horrific his third form is, they can't imagine how gross he'll look in his final form. His transformation finishes, and he reveals his ultimate transformation. He's actually a lot shorter than normal, he doesn't look like anyone expected. His battle begins with the Dragon Team, but in the middle of the fight, the Dragon Team and Vegeta all sense something. It's not Goku, it's someone else that they haven't sensed before, and the key they sense feels pretty terrifying. They stop in the middle of the fight and Freeze is kinda confused, until he looks up in the sky and sees a ship arriving. Followed by that, a few smaller ships. These aren't people from Earth, and these definitely aren't people from the Frieza Force, but Frieza is able to recognize one of the ships. He remembers from long ago. Without a doubt, that's his brother Cooler. Frieza is pretty surprised that he didn't think of this sooner. Of course Cooler has been spying on him, and this would be the perfect opportunity to strike. While he wasn't concerned about the Dragon Team, he's concerned now about his brother. This could meddle in his plans a bit, but Frieza actually isn't too worried. He gives a sigh of annoyance, but still feels like he can actually kill his brother, and he doesn't mind doing that. That would actually be the preferable option. He tells the Dragon Team that he'll deal with them later, as now, he has to go and face his brother. This comes as a shock to everyone, finding out that Frieza has a brother that seems about as powerful as Frieza himself. Vegeta is honestly pretty shocked too. He's heard rumors about Cooler, but didn't know it was actually true. And from what he knows in rumors, Cooler was actually stronger than Frieza, and he wasn't chosen as leader because of how harsh he was. After seeing how strong Frieza is already, and knowing that Cooler might even be above him, Vegeta's lost all hope. This may get really messy. Cooler's ship lands, and his squad actually goes out to seek out other power levels, and they find the Dragon Team. They'll take care of these pests, and make sure no one gets in the way, while Cooler takes on Frieza. Frieza flies over to where his brother is, and sees him standing there. Cooler is elated. Now is his opportunity. They start out with formalities, hiding the disgust they have for each other. Frieza plays dumb and wants to know why his brother's here. Cooler doesn't hide anything. He's here to take the Dragon Balls from his brother, as well as defeat him. Frieza has some unfortunate news for his brother. The Dragon Balls have already become useless, with a wish already being stolen from him. Cooler wasn't expecting this, but no matter. From what he could tell, the Frieza Force has been completely eradicated on this planet, including people like Zarbon, Dodoria, and the entire Ginyu Force. Besides those smaller power levels that they scouted out before, Frieza's the only obstacle here. No matter. Even without the Dragon Balls, he could still defeat its brother like he wanted. He's exceptionally angry now, too, about the fact that there's no Dragon Balls, so this is perfect. He has someone to take his anger out on. It's surprising to him to see that his brother's actually out of his suppression. Were those other power levels able to actually draw out his final form? His brother must be really weak if he needed that to defeat those guys. Because otherwise, from most of the times that he's seen Frieza, he always stayed in his first form. His brother is pathetic. The two of them slowly rise into the air, preparing to fight. Frieza and Cooler begin their duel, and it can be sensed all the way across the planet from the Dragon Team. Let's actually get back to the Dragon Team right now. Because while this fight's going on, they eventually meet Cooler's Armored Squadron. We don't have much in terms of information about them, but Weekly Shonen Jump actually showed us that their power was above the Ginyu Force. But their power actually isn't an issue. Gohan and Krillin would probably have trouble taking them on, and we don't really know Piccolo's power level, but considering how strong he was against Frieza, he'd be more than enough to take on these guys, as well as Vegeta who's about 250,000 in terms of his power level at this point. The battle doesn't take too long as Piccolo and Vegeta work together to take them out. But out of nowhere, they sense another signature of Ki. Oh wait, this time it's good. It's Goku. Goku flies over to where they are, wanting to meet up with them first. He could tell they're not with Frieza right now, and from what he can tell, there's another giant power that Frieza's facing right now. Goku meets up with everyone, and here's the news. Apparently, Frieza's brother has arrived on Namek, and just from sensing the power alone, he can tell that this guy named Cooler is actually stronger than Frieza. He also gets confirmation from Vegeta about this. They wonder, why is this guy here? Will he actually be able to defeat Frieza for them? One thing that they do know is, he's not on their side. He sent his armored squadron here and they killed them, so that's not really good news. For now, they'll just have to wait and see how this turns out. Goku felt confident that he might be able to fight Frieza, but this guy, he doesn't know about. It seems his power is way higher than he could ever expect. Back to the battle, things aren't going too well for Frieza. His brother is a great match for him in terms of power. And it's been a while since Frieza actually had a good fight. Frieza's even at 100% right now. 
He feels like if he's able to draw this fight out long enough and outsmart his brother, he might actually be able to win. But oh no, it's not gonna go that well for Frieza. Cooler questions his brother. Is this truly his full power, his actual final form? Frieza confirms this. This is his maximum output. And he commends his brother for getting him to go this far in terms of power. This makes Cooler pretty happy. He gives his brother one last tidbit of info. He holds out a single finger. One. Frieza's confused. Cooler informs his brother. He has one more form above this. He's still suppressed. Frieza is terrified. There's no way. His brother has to be bluffing. He's in his final form now, isn't he? He tries to brush it off, acting like he's not bothered by it, thinking it's some kind of sick joke. There's no way his brother has gotten a form above his final one. He definitely has to be at his full power right now. Cooler smirks. He yells out to his brother. You should feel honored. You're the first, and soon to be the last, to witness my ultimate transformation. He proceeds to grow larger, growing spikes on his body. It's a grotesque transformation, one that not only has a terrifying power, but looks terrifying as well. The transformation completes. A mask goes up on Cooler's mouth, distorting his voice. Frieza is paralyzed with fear. Cooler rushes his younger brother and gives him one powerful gut punch, followed by him elbowing Frieza into the ground. Before Frieza could even get back on his feet, his brother is there again. Finally, he got what he wants. He's going to finally kill Frieza. He wants to savor this moment. He draws his arm back and then lunges it forward into Frieza's chest, piercing right through him. He falls to his knees, dying. It seems now, Cooler is the leader of whatever remains of Frieza's army. Next, he has to take on King Cold. He watches as Frieza dies, happy to see that he's finally accomplished what he wanted his whole life. Cooler has taken the throne and now has power. Now, he has to find his armored squadron and they'll get out of here. They have no other use for this planet. That's odd. It seems like he can't sense them. Even going through communications on his ship, he can't get to their scouters. There's no way. Did those small power levels actually kill his squadron? No, there has to be some other explanation. He goes out to their last known location, flying across the planet, surveying it. Goku and his group are utterly speechless. They could tell what happened. Frieza went to his full power, which is way higher than anyone expected, and Cooler was still able to kill him. How are they supposed to take this guy down? Moreover, what about the Dragon Balls? Cooler is rushing towards their location, and they need to think of a plan quickly. Hide or face him? What are they supposed to do? There's no way they could take this guy out, is there? Vegeta's even warning against it. They need to retreat right now and hide from this guy. Time's ticking. Well, surprise, surprise, a lot of you said that they should just hide, which probably is the best course of action here. There's no way they could fight Cooler. If they thought Frieza was a challenge, this was completely different. When they sensed him fighting Frieza, they already got a taste of his power, so they know that they're no match at all. So now their only option is to hide. I kind of imagine it going like Jurassic Park, where they're just staying deathly quiet and still as some monsters lurking about trying to find them. Cooler even kind of looks scary like a dinosaur. Weird little parallel. In a cave, all of them completely drop their key, even trying to hold their breath a little bit as to not be heard. They focus and try to sense where Cooler is, flying around the planet and gradually getting closer and closer to them. Briefly, he even peers into the cave, seemingly trying to be quiet himself as well, just so he can get the jump on everyone. Everyone is terrified. They feel like Cooler is even looking right at them. In his frustration, Cooler gives up his search, and decides to depart the planet, but not without giving it a parting gift. He knows they're still on the planet and he wants them to have some fun. As he boards his ship, he creates a small ball of energy and flings it directly down to Namek's core, starting its slow destruction. The planet begins shaking violently and everyone knows what just happened. Cracks appear everywhere and lava begins shooting out of the ground seemingly at random. It's pretty easy to deduce that the planet is exploding. Quickly, they go to find Bulma, who is unsurprisingly pretty terrified. Vegeta of course tags along with them, not really knowing what else to do, and although they're wary of him, they're fine with him coming along. Thinking his victory is secured, Cooler gives a nice little grin, saying his goodbyes to the planet, launching far off into deep space. Hastily, the Dragon Team and Vegeta all are able to find Goku's ship and take it back to Earth. Just as the planet bursts, they are able to escape. I mean, they'd probably have about 20 or 30 episodes to do so, considering it took 5 minutes to blow up Namek. Every time someone makes a joke about Namek blowing up in 5 minutes, Toei delays Dragon Ball Super's anime by a month. Please, no more. In all seriousness though, they almost died so they're pretty terrified. And now they've basically got Frieza on steroids running around in space. So uh, what now? Well, on the way back, after everyone gets their panic attacks done with, they try and figure out what to do. Cooler may actually think they're dead, which is a really good sign, but they're still pretty concerned about him obviously. Vegeta theorizes that he must have known about the Dragon Balls as well. 
He did kill Frieza, but he could have done that long before if he wanted to. There has to be some underlying reason that he came to Namek and actually at this point in time. And the only real reason is the Dragon Balls. And if he knew about the Dragon Balls, that means he's been spying on Frieza. And Vegeta by extension. And that poses a pretty big issue. Since there are Dragon Balls on Earth, now that Piccolo's back to life, that would mean Cooler might potentially know of it and have that as his next target. The thing is though, he might also think that Earth doesn't have Dragon Balls anymore, which is why everyone went to Namek. He doesn't know that Piccolo's alive and the Dragon Balls are back on Earth. And one of the great things is that they were able to revive their friend Piccolo, but sadly, there still are three other people they need to revive. While they didn't fully accomplish their goals, they're happy to at least have Piccolo and Kami back on Earth with them. That's two out of five, so they're 40% the way there. Wait, never mind, Namek's gone, so that pushed them back way further. That's another conundrum they're thinking about. What are they supposed to do about Namek too? They have a lot on their mind right now. They need to bring Namek and the Namekians back, they need to bring their friends back, and somehow, they need to prepare for the threat that is cooler. This Herculean task seems almost impossible, but there is some hope. First, let's go over to King Kai's planet for a little bit. Since everyone on the planet knows they're basically gonna be stuck there for a while, they might as well start with some more intense training. The three of them find out about Kaioken, and if they're gonna be stuck here a few more months, they might as well try and learn it together. Their training's already going really well so far, so why not pick up a few techniques while they're here? And in case they are able to come back by the time Cooler's on Earth, they might actually be able to help if they learn stuff like the Kaioken and the Spirit Bomb. So they start picking up the slack. In a completely far away part of space, Cooler is feeling some of the same things that the Dragon Team is feeling right now. He doesn't know what to do. He's at a crossroads and he doesn't know what his next course of action will be. He killed Frieza, but honestly he thought he'd never get this far. Well, he knew he was superior to his brother, but he actually went out and did it, which was pretty cool for him. And of course he still does feel very bitter about losing his loyal armored squadron and the Dragon Balls. Unlike what Vegeta theorized though, Cooler doesn't actually know that Dragon Balls are on Earth, or of the planet's existence at all. Well, at least not right now. In whatever archives he has about Frieza's army, he begins searching to see what he could find. Dragon Balls might exist elsewhere, but first he has to find out where Frieza heard about them and what may actually be the source of them. The good thing is he has the full Frieza force at his disposal, well, not the full Frieza Force, he pretty much slaughtered everyone that was left. But, whatever remains of it are there, he's controlling it right now. And King Cold, he actually decides to spare him. He knows he holds the power over his father. There's no point in even calling him King anymore. Cooler is the King right now. King Cooler. And Cold is just Cold. He really only wanted to kill Frieza. And since Cold already knows that Frieza is dead and that Cooler's taking control of his army, Cooler feels the punishment is sufficient and King Cold is suffering enough. Cold is understandably pretty angered, and he wants to stop this. He also wants to gain the Dragon Balls to revive Frieza, and usurp the power from Cooler. But now he has to bide his time, because he knows he can't do anything about his son right now. So he'll work with Cooler, but double-cross him when the time is right. Well, hopefully he can. Going back to Earth, the limitations of the Dragon Balls are actually going to leave everyone in an odd spot. Because if they use the Dragon Balls now, they're going to have to wait another year for them to be active again. They want to revive the Namekians, and with the help of King Kai, they want those Namekians to revive their three friends. But, they also need to bring back Namek in order to revive the Namekians. Because if they revive them right now, they'll just be floating in outer space. And if they bring Namek back, Cooler may notice it right away and just blow it up again, negating all of their progress. So first, they need to actually defeat Cooler, and then they could try and bring back Namek as well as everyone else. They have to train like never before. Not long ago, they faced the threat of the Saiyans and then eventually Frieza, but Cooler completely overshadows any enemy they've ever faced in the past. More power and influence than Frieza, more terror than King Piccolo, a bigger army than the Saiyans or the Red Ribbon army, and most importantly of all, bigger shoulders than Ten Shinhan, truly a force to be reckoned with. They need some new method of training, and it seems like gravity training is the right way to go. On his way to Namek, Goku already saw the benefits of it, so he decides that everyone else should join him. With the help of Bulma and Dr. Briefs, they're able to turn the ship into an actual training room, as well as making some accommodations to make it more powerful. Plus, Vegeta's obviously going to join in. And this may start his interactions with the Bulma a little earlier on. So instead of tracking down Cooler right now, they're going to prepare instead, because they know he's going to arrive eventually. Training actually goes pretty well. Krillin getting his potential unlocked really helped, and Gohan starting to get the hang of his training. As for Piccolo, his fusion with Nail made his power skyrocket. Goku, of course, has all his training and his Zenkais from beforehand, as well as Vegeta. So everyone has a really great start and it goes very well. They reach new heights that they never thought they could reach before. Vegeta gets more and more confident and motivated during his training. Kakarot is truly special, and it seems he's very powerful. It gets him thinking, is Kakarot 
a Super Saiyan, Goku's power alone makes Vegeta think this. And as his power and Gohan's power increase, he thinks the three of them all are Super Saiyan somehow. Of course, they're not actually Super Saiyans yet, it's what Vegeta thinks is a Super Saiyan. They don't know about the whole transformation and all. Vegeta just sees someone strong and thinks, oh yeah, that's a Super Saiyan. And Piccolo's a Super Namekian, and Krillin's a Super Human. They're all Super. Dragon Ball Super. Let's cue the theme song. Jokes aside, they're feeling very confident right now, and they're actually making some progress towards fighting cooler. And all the while, of course everyone on King Kai's planet is training too. So while they may not be on Earth to fight Cooler, they're still getting strong in their own right. Time passes, and off in space, Cooler and Cold are going through all the data they could find, trying to figure out how Frieza found out about the Dragon Balls. It is a bit hard because Frieza himself is obviously dead, and if any soldier knew anything about it, they're probably dead as well because they went on the mission with Frieza, and subsequently died on Namek too. After some digging and some thinking, they are able to find out that originally, Vegeta seemed to be the source of the info. Apparently he was also on Namek, and he probably died once Cooler blew it up, or Frieza's forces may have killed him, so he probably won't be an issue either. But the most interesting part is where he found this info from. There's apparently a planet somewhere called Earth, which has its own set of Dragon Balls, because it had its own Namekian inhabitants for some reason. But according to the data they could find, the Namekian there did die because of Vegeta, and from what they could gather, the Namekians are the source of the Dragon Balls. Little do they know that Piccolo is alive there, as well as Kami, but that doesn't really matter to them. They're gonna take their chance and go to Earth anyways to see if they can find something. They don't really know how the Dragon Balls work, and there is a shot that the Dragon Balls still could be there. Cooler has decided that he'll steal his brother's wish for immortality, but as for Cold, he plans to steal the wish for himself, pulling the rug from underneath Cooler and wishing to bring back Frieza. Secretly, Cold has done a very small amount of training. The thought of it disgusts him, and while he doesn't really want to train, he thinks that it might help him overpower Cooler if the time ever comes, especially if he tries to increase his power and unlock a new stage of suppression like his son's. But Cooler is just too far ahead of him in power, so will he even be able to defeat him somehow? That's where Frieza comes in. If he's able to bring Frieza back and the two of them work together, maybe they can kill Cooler and get their army back. Both Cooler and Cold are excited to go to Earth because of their wishes, and currently, it's about one and a half years after the original events on Namek. With all of their research and digging done, they decide it's time to head to Earth, to see if there is any Dragon Balls there. With one massive ship, Cooler begins his journey with Cold and some other small forces. Back on Earth, in some sort of wasteland, a ship appears carrying one of the most formidable fighters in the universe. This fighter arriving on Earth with the intent of killing someone. Oblivious to this arrival, the Dragon Team eventually senses some new power coming towards them. It seems a little bit unfamiliar. No, this isn't actually Cooler that arrived on Earth, but they're ready to fight. Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Piccolo, and Krillin all head towards the source of power, ready to face whatever's coming towards them. They eventually meet halfway with this warrior, and it's not some threat from outer space. It seems to be a regular guy, wearing a jacket and with a sword on his back. He actually seems somewhat happy to see everyone, but also confused. Where are the other fighters and where's Frieza? Did he arrive too late or something? Understandably, everyone's confused. Frieza is dead. What is this guy talking about? He introduces himself. He says that he's a warrior from the future, and his name is Trunks, hiding his identity as best as possible. Wait a second. The purple hair, that name Trunks. This immediately leaves Vegeta speechless. There's no way this could actually be happening. Little do the others know, Vegeta and Bulma are apparently expecting a baby. And while Vegeta isn't really around her that much, he remembers her mentioning that he'll have a son, and she wanted to name him something like Trunks. Vegeta knows who this is. It's his unborn son from the future. Much to everyone's shock, including Trunks, Vegeta looks at Trunks and says one thing. So this is how his son will turn out. The rest of the Dragon Team is understandably speechless, and Trunks is surprised but kinda happy that Vegeta knows who he is. But that means something's wrong here. Trunks won't be born for another few years. How does Vegeta know who he is? According to Vegeta, he'll be born a few months from now, which means something went terribly wrong in this timeline. Trunks didn't go to the past. He went to an alternate timeline. So right now we're actually entering a new saga, one that I wrote entirely for this what if and that doesn't exist in the original story. Cooler is on its quest to find Earth, and is preparing to invade. We now have entered the Cooler Force Saga. Picking up from last time, Trunks explains all that he needs to explain, and he figures out what's going on here and why things are different. It's already a bad sign that Vegeta knew who he was because he felt like he made ripples in history, and the timelines are pretty much screwed. There's so much different here that he immediately comes to the conclusion that the two timelines are different, but he decides he's going to help anyways. While Trunks is explaining everything to everyone, and warning them about the androids and the heart virus, 
The group suddenly senses something coming towards Earth. Many malicious keys are coming towards Earth, and the group immediately knows what's going on. Cooler is finally making his move. The group notices this and decides to head out, really not having any option here. The odd thing is, they can't sense Cooler and Cold. Well, actually, they can, but they just don't know it. Cooler and Cold are suppressing their keys so much that they blend in with everyone else there. I mean, both of them have been training and they picked up on this. I do want to discuss powers, but we're at a point in the story where power levels became kind of irrelevant. Because around the time that Trunks showed up, power levels stopped being used entirely. So we're going to do some simple scaling here. As for the protagonist, I'm going to say Trunks and Goku are actually around equal in base. Goku's had a very rigorous training here, and while we don't know how strong he was in comparison to Trunks in the original story, they seem to be very similar around this point, but again, we don't really know too much in detail. So in a scenario like this, I think it might be realistic to assume that Goku's at least on Trunks' level, if not a little bit above. The same goes for Vegeta, who is probably equal to Trunks or just below. Behind that we have Gohan, and not too far behind that is Piccolo. And a little farther behind Piccolo is Krillin. The thing is here, Goku with Kaioken times 20 is far above something like Frieza, but in terms of fighting Cooler, they don't know how he'd fare against him. As for Trunks though, in Super Saiyan, it seems like he might be strong enough to face Cooler, but they base this idea on how powerful Cooler was beforehand, they don't know he's actually been training a bit, so it might be hard to fight him. The Cooler Force spreads around the planet, with thousands of soldiers in every city. The bad thing is they don't have tracking technology for the Dragon Balls, and on Namek all the Dragon Balls were located in villages, here they're just spread randomly across the Earth. So the best option for the Cooler Force right now is to invade every part of Earth, seeing if they can somehow find Dragon Balls. The army swarms everywhere, even forcing civilians to help find Dragon Balls. And by doing that, they have tens if not hundreds of thousands of people looking for them, possibly even more. Cooler is confident that this will work, as the entire planet is overrun by his army threatening millions who were unfortunate enough to live in the areas that got invaded. The dragon team splits up, Gohan and Krillin get a dragon radar and look for the Dragon Balls, while Goku, Vegeta, Trunks, and Piccolo go into cities, trying to help anyone that's being threatened, and also looking for Cooler and Cold. The Cooler Force soldiers are nothing to these guys, so single-handedly they're able to liberate cities and save a bunch of the population. As for Gohan and Krillin, they do end up getting some Dragon Balls, and they bring them to the lookout for safety. They have four right now, and since they only need three more, they could probably do that in one trip. Alongside this, Kami lets them bring others to the lookout, so Chi Chi, Bulma, Roshi, etc. are all up there, in order to keep them safe. Cooler is watching as his army is getting decimated, and he decides to finally step in, with Cold staying back at command. Cooler begins focusing his senses, and he can sense the dragon team. Interestingly enough, the two people with the lowest powers are actually moving the quickest, making brief stops and then immediately leaving. Those other guys that are fighting Cooler's army aren't doing the same, so these two must be playing some scheme. Cooler decides to track down these two powers, and then he finds what's going on. He catches up to Gohan and Krillin, and it seems he made the right choice. He notices that Gohan's holding something, and it must be Cooler's lucky day because it's a Dragon Ball. The two attempt to fight, but they can't do anything. Cooler pimp slaps Krillin, injuring him badly and knocking him out, as he then shoots a beam at Gohan, making him fall to the ground. Cooler walks up to Gohan, and notices that he's holding a Dragon Radar as well. This should be pretty useful for him, so he decides to take it. Thinking he already killed Krillin, he decides to finish off Gohan now, eradicating him with a single blast. The Dragon Radar and one Dragon Ball are now Coolers, and with this radar he can complete his conquest. Not too far away in a nearby city, Goku can sense this and is immediately angered and worried. He's hoping that it isn't what he thinks, because all of a sudden, Krillin and Gohan's power disappear. He leaves the rest of the group trying to find Gohan and Krillin. Cooler makes haste gathering Dragon Balls, with Cold joining him as well. They have two now and need to find one more. And after they get the last one, they can head to the four that are clustered together somewhere. Finding the final Dragon Ball, they then head to the lookout, where Kami is trying to stall them. They obviously can't fight these guys, but Kami knows he's not in danger and he threatens to destroy himself. And if he does so, the Dragon Balls won't work anymore. And with this, Kami is able to protect everyone and delay them. Cooler and Cold trying to figure out what to do, as they search around the lookout. They then find some humans hiding around, and if they can't kill Kami, they can threaten to kill these guys. When they're searching around for people, this distracts them, and it gives Kami a perfect opportunity. Cooler seems like the strongest one, so it might be wise to use the technique on him. Throwing down two containers, Kami first uses the Mafuba on Cooler, sealing him easily. He then prepares to seal Cold, with Roshi about to jump in and try the same even if it will kill him. But Cold is now alert and this won't work too easily. He picks up Cooler's container, and Cold thanks him for dealing with his son. He was kind of a pest, and this means he can get the wish as well. 
If he doesn't get the Dragon Balls, he'll just kill everyone on the lookout. But Kami then quickly gets another idea. He runs over to the Dragon Balls, picking them up quickly and then teleporting to each person on the lookout. With Kami teleporting all over the place, this confuses Cold. But once Kami gathers everyone up, he teleports out of the lookout, to the only place that he knows is safe, King Yama's place. King Yama's wondering what he's doing here with all these people, but then Kami explains that King Yama allows it. This is really the only safe haven they have right now. Cold looks on the radar and he sees that the Dragon Balls have headed elsewhere. Actually, they don't appear on the radar at all. Furious, he doesn't know what to do, and decides he's gonna head back to his ship. He holds on the cooler's capsule and then retreats, planning to destroy Earth once he leaves. But first, he actually wants to finish off Cooler. Maybe if he crushes this container, it will kill his son. So he places it on the ground and steps on it. But it does just the opposite. This was a stupid move on Cold's part because then it frees Cooler from containment, although he's very weakened now. This causes a clash to begin between the two, one that's been boiling up for a long time. Cooler can't believe that Cold would have betrayed him, but he doesn't care too much. He doesn't have too much use for him anymore. Cold doesn't know if he could win, but he's set on killing Cooler and regaining control. Meanwhile, elsewhere on Earth, Goku is searching for Gohan and Krillin, with the rest of the group following him to make sure everything's okay. Goku is able to find Krillin, and thankfully he's alive, although he's badly hurt. He's given a Senzu and then he regains consciousness. But where's Gohan? Trunks keeps looking around and then he sees Gohan's body near Krillin, and fearfully he tells Goku not to look. But it's too late. Goku sees what happens, and he immediately snaps. From his sadness and anger, Goku loses all control and goes Super Saiyan and realizes he has that form that Trunks showed off before. He doesn't even care about that right now though. With his burning rage, he's not thinking clearly, and decides to head off to the lookout immediately wanting to get the Dragon Balls himself and revive Gohan. The group chases after him, trying to suppress their powers but they can't keep up by doing so, because they know now that they'll be spotted. Goku arrives in the lookout and he sees it's destroyed, and thinks that the worst happened, with everyone dying up there. Right before he absolutely loses it, Kami begins talking in his head. He tells Goku that they're all okay, and he needs to control his anger or else he might lose control and hurt other people unknowingly. Kami says that the Dragon Balls are safe with him, except for three of them that Cold has right now, and they're all protected at King Yama's place. Kami also doesn't tell Chi Chi right now that Gohan died because, well, that would be a disaster. He feels bad withholding this, but I mean, he's not just gonna come out and say that right away, especially when they might be able to revive him soon. And frankly, if he does tell Chi Chi, he's scared of her. Kami's seen what she could do and it will be especially bad if he gets the blame. Anywho, Goku regains focus, and he then senses a fight going on as the rest of the group catches up. They are all so distracted that they didn't notice these two powers clashing, and they immediately recognize one of the presences as Cooler. Vegeta thinks that the other one is pretty familiar, and he says this must be King Cold. Trunks powers up into Super Saiyan as well, as Vegeta, Piccolo, and Krillin follow the two of them towards the location. They might not be enough to face Cooler and Cold, but it seems that they're distracted right now and possibly weakened. And with those two in that state, they might be able to win. Moving back over to Cooler and Cold, the two are preoccupied. But they then notice something coming towards them. He doesn't know who these guys are, but then he realizes they must be the ones who killed a squadron. Two guys with blonde hair, a Namekian, some random human, and then a person that Cold recognizes as Prince Vegeta. Cooler's glad they showed up, because now he can carry out his revenge. He puts his fight with Cold on hold. That was a nice accidental rhyme there but he prepares to fight the group as Goku steps up to the plate, with Trunks facing down Cold. Goku and Cooler immediately begin fighting, and they're evenly matched. Cooler is definitely stronger, but he's been weakened from his fight in the Mafuba, while Goku's only been facing some Cooler Force soldiers. And now with Super Saiyan, he's basically in peak condition. The two trade blows that shake the Earth, with Trunks and Cold doing the same as Vegeta, Piccolo, and Krillin watch from the side. It's amazing how strong a Super Saiyan is, and Vegeta's impressed, both with his son and Kakarot. Truly, they bring honor to the Saiyan race. During their fight, Cold tries to fire a blast towards Cooler and Goku, interfering with that battle. Even though he trained more than Cooler, it still wasn't enough, and he was badly injured in his battle. I mean, to be fair, the two of them didn't really train too much, they kinda hated it. You know, probably a couple days for Cold and even less for Cooler. If they actually trained more, who knows where they'd be right now. That's besides the point. Cold tries to interfere with the battle, but then his beam is blocked by Trunks. Distracted by this, Cold then feels something piercing through his chest, as Trunks hits him with his sword. Perfect, it's time for the finishing blow. Trunks slices up Cooler, and then with a burning attack, he eradicates him completely. This also briefly distracts Cooler, and lets Goku get a good hit in. Cooler is now losing ground, and he makes a comment that that brat he killed earlier must have been Goku's. Part of Goku did want to spare Cooler, but he knows this guy will never turn good no matter how many choices he's given. Especially after this comment, he doesn't know how a guy so cruel and merciless can exist. 
What Cooler did was unforgivable. Summoning all of his rage and power, he attacks Cooler at full force, then hitting the new Emperor with a gut punch that goes right through him. This severely wounds Cooler, but he's still alive. He brushes this off as just a scratch, but it leaves him staggering and badly injured. Temporarily stunned, Goku then fires a massive Kamehameha using all of his energy, catching Cooler off guard. Goku puts all of his energy into it, and it sends Cooler flying off into space. Cooler tries to resist, but he can't, and then he looks behind him and sees. He's heading right towards the sun. The blast throws Cooler into the sun, eradicating him for good. Tired, Goku goes back into base, feeling defeated and sad. The remains of Cooler's army try to escape, as Vegeta and Piccolo blow up all the ships that are leaving. Although they did lose Gohan, this may be good because now Cooler and Cole are dead, and Krillin mentions this which cheers Goku up. King Kai contacts Goku and says that the Namekians are in Otherworld now, so they can be revived right away and they'll stay temporarily in the afterlife. King Kai pulls some strings and he'll allow this due to the circumstances. Kami has also made some adjustments to the Dragon Balls, due to what's going on. Normally, they wouldn't be able to revive a group after a year of being dead. But since Kami knew they were going to revive the Namekians eventually, he adjusted Shenron so he could revive a group that's been dead longer than a year, but only for this one time. He doesn't want to make the Dragon Balls too overpowered. But I mean, if he didn't do this, then they couldn't revive all the Namekians at once, since it's been well over a year at this point, and then they would have had to revive everyone individually, and it would have been a whole mess. Anywho, Kami comes back to Earth, and then Shenron is summoned. They wish to revive anyone killed by Cooler, Cold, and Frieza's army, which revives everyone on Earth, including Gohan. And this wish also revives all the Namekians as well. And surprisingly enough, it brings back the humans on King Kai's planet, because they were killed by Nappa and Vegeta who technically were part of Frieza's army at that point still. Although it did take a while, it's a good thing Kami made those temporary adjustments to Shenron. And now with Cooler and Cold gone, they could finally bring back planet Namek. So in Otherworld, the Namekians summoned Purunga wishing to bring back Namek and then teleporting them all there. They give their thanks to King Kai, telling him to thank everyone on Earth as well, as their planet is finally restored and they can head back to peace. And as a gift, their third wish to Paranga is to restore all the damage done to Earth, fixing every city that was destroyed. Earth is at peace once again, well, at least for the next few years. Trunks reminds Goku about the androids and the heart medicine, and they all thank Trunks for his help. Vegeta says he'll look forward to seeing him again, and Trunks gives a thumbs up as he heads off promising to return in a few years. And with everyone back on Earth, they can actually prepare for the androids here. And it's not like Tenshinhan, Yamcha, and Chaozu have been doing nothing on Kinkai's planet. They've been training a lot and that's about to show off in the next part. So, over the next three years, everyone begins training. The humans are brought back to life, which is great, because they got some awesome training with King Kai as well. They're not going to be on the sidelines here, they're actually pretty strong now. But, of course, the Saiyans that did fight Cooler, they're stronger as well. Sadly, this means Krillin would probably be left behind a bit as the Saiyans and those with King Kai got ahead of him. But even with all that, much of the first parts of this arc go pretty normally, due to the scaling of the androids. They would most likely be stronger as well, Jiro would be spying on everyone, and of course he'd adjust the androids' power to account for this increase in power with everyone else that he's trying to kill. So, things go pretty much the same. Jiro and 19 are killed, Goku succumbs to the heart virus, and the other androids are awoken, and they pretty much beat everyone in the group. We will see some changes here though, Piccolo almost goes to fight Cell, but being wary of the Dragon Balls, he decides to train with the humans instead. And thankfully, Goku does eventually wake up and gets the idea of going into the Room of Spirit in time. Vegeta and Trunks are the first ones to head in. And while the other two androids are stronger, 16 is pretty much the same, and Cell would also remain the same, being from another timeline and all. As we mentioned, Cooler only existed in this timeline, so in Cell's timeline, none of the people there would have had this experience, and Cell wouldn't have Cooler Cells in him. It's the same guy, same genetic makeup, same strength, same abilities. But see, while the androids are stronger, it's not like they're too much stronger. Cell pursues them, ready to absorb them, since they're pretty much on their own with no one fighting them. His first target is the weakest of the group, Android 18. But he notices Android 16. Thrown off by his size, he thinks this is the strongest android, and also, he assumes he could absorb some energy from him. In the middle of the city, while the android's guards are lowered, Cell first attacks 16 but his tail just bounces off him. And of course, 16 notices. Then Cell realizes, this isn't a cyborg like the other two. He's a robot, meaning he's fully mechanical. And of course, this alerts the rest of the group, but Cell doesn't care. He's absorbed so many people by now that he's very strong. He was never even interrupted by Piccolo, meaning he also didn't get to absorb some energy from Piccolo. But regardless, he's absorbed so many people by now that he feels confident in his strength. First, 17 offers to fight him, being wary of the tail. And even with 17's increase in strength, he still has a decently tough time against Cell. I'd say the two are almost matched in terms of power. 
with 17 being slightly weaker. But already, this is better for the androids, because originally this wouldn't have been the case. 17 gets more confident as he then realizes he has something that Cell doesn't, infinite energy. The two fight, and I imagine this would go a lot like 17 versus Piccolo. 17 has the advantage in terms of stamina, while both of them are matched in terms of power, or at least almost matched. But of course, the androids recognize this threat, and 17 is then joined by 18. Together, the two of them are able to greatly overpower Cell, with 16 even getting some hits in. They basically play volleyball with the bio android, and together, the two twins decide to finish him off. With a combined attack, they launch a beam at Cell, and for good measure, 16 even joins in, and they don't hold back at all. They already know about Cell's regeneration by now in the fight. So with a combined blast from the three of them, they all kill Cell. That wasn't too bad, huh? While things look good now for them, they're not gonna go so well later on. Vegeta and Trunks then exit the Room of Spirit in time, now with Super Saiyan Grade 4. They've had such a great head start when they were training for Cooler, or at least when Vegeta was. And after the experience, they got stronger. So it seems likely that they'd get Grade 4 before Goku and Gohan do. But Goku takes note of this. He'll find another way above that even, as he heads in with Gohan. Vegeta and Trunks are pretty confident, so then they go to fight the androids, with the humans and Piccolo joining them as well. They seem to have more than enough manpower. Vegeta faces 17 as Trunks faces 18, with everyone else fighting Android 16. The androids are actually pretty surprised. Why are these people back already? Do they really think they could win? Their cockiness fades as they then face off against everyone. Despite them having infinite energy, Vegeta and Trunks greatly overpower Android 17 and 18. Knowing Trunks, he'd probably get the job done quickly, killing 18 right off the bat. And you know, Vegeta kinda wanted a cool fight, but he'll show off as well, killing 17 relatively quickly. And as for 16, the group has some struggle because they've only had a few days of training, but without 17 or 18 there to interrupt in the fight, it doesn't even matter that Vegeta and Trunks aren't there to help them. But regardless, everyone claimed victory over the androids, and that's what's important. And now, Trunks can go back to his timeline and do the same thing. But there is one important thing that I should mention. Goku and Gohan exit the Room of Spirit in time, and not only did they get Super Saiyan Grade 4, but they even went above that, getting Super Saiyan 2. With such a great head start beforehand, and knowing about what Vegeta and Trunks did, I wouldn't be surprised if they'd be able to access this in the Room of Spirit in time. Damn that Kakarot, surpassing him as always. But everything ends happily, and Goku remains alive. So now we're gonna skip a few years, heading into the Buu Saga. And honestly here, the changes would be a little bit negligible at first. Kinda like how it was in the Android Saga. But as the arc continues, there's a few changes that will take effect. Structurally, a lot of this arc would still go the same. Even though many people are stronger here, the only realistic difference I could see is maybe Gohan defeats Debora at first. But once Boo is revived, that obviously doesn't even matter. Another thing to note, of course, 18 also isn't alive, but she didn't really do too much in this arc anyway, so that doesn't really matter. As for Majin Vegeta, I still believe that would likely happen, regardless of Goku being alive here. He keeps one up in Vegeta, and Vegeta would probably harbor the same feelings of wanting to defeat Kakarot, so I believe this could still be a possibility. Vegeta would see this as a great opportunity to return to his normal self, feeling that he's gotten soft on Earth, and it would be a great opportunity to defeat Kakarot. After Majin Vegeta's death, Goku would be the one to try and hold off Buu, not being able to win, but stalling him at least temporarily, promising a better fight soon. Of course here, he wouldn't know Super Saiyan 3, or at least wouldn't be using it. If he did end up learning it, he would know it's useless due to the key leak that he has. When he was dead, he didn't have to worry about this issue, but if he discovered this form while alive, he'd come to the conclusion that it's only useful for short bursts of power. Otherwise, it's not really something he's gonna be fighting with a lot. Another big change, of course, no fusion, meaning Gotenks isn't gonna be fighting Buu. If anything, the people trying to hold Buu off would be the humans and Piccolo, alongside Goku. Everyone would believe Gohan dead after Buu supposedly killed him, but really this entire time he'd be training on the sacred world of Kai. Once Buu becomes Super Buu, this huge group might actually stand a chance to fight him. Sure, he's much more cunning now, but in terms of strength, they may be able to be a good match. All these years of training for the humans has been pretty good, and for Goku, he is stronger as well, even though he's only gonna be using Super Saiyan 2. And like I mentioned, he could still use Super Saiyan 3 in short bursts. They wouldn't be enough to kill Buu, but they could hold him off long enough. But thankfully, that ended up being saved. Arriving from the sacred world of Kai's, Gohan surprisingly returns. Everyone thought he was dead, but it turns out he survived. And somehow, he's a lot stronger than before. Even without Goku on the Sacred World of Kai's, Gohan would most likely get the idea of testing out the Z-Sword still. I mean, since it broke as easily as it did before, it definitely seems like a Gohan thing to do. Testing out the sword by slicing something, meaning Shin would create a block of Kachin, and the rest is history. With Gohan's power in addition to everyone else's, the group is more than enough to defeat Buu. And since everyone else is here, they make sure that Gohan doesn't screw up. And everyone watches each other's back so they don't get absorbed. 
Gohan fights Super Buu alongside Goku and the others, who act as support, and Ultimate Gohan gets the kill on Buu. So the Buu saga was a bit easier, but not incredibly easy. Thankfully, Namek's Dragon Balls are able to revive everyone, including Vegeta. And with how this arc ended, there'd be no good Buu alive anymore. Also, Ub wouldn't be a thing, but that doesn't really come into play here anyways. But once we start going into Super, we'll see some more changes here. Battle of Gods, though, is more or less the same. Goku is stronger, as are Vegeta and Gohan. But when we're talking about Beerus, of course that's not going to change much. So, the ritual goes the same, Goku gets Super Saiyan God, and he and Vegeta end up training with Beerus and Whis. Pretty routine. Now we're caught up. I'm pretty sure you could all tell what I'm leading up to by now. But I've covered the three arcs that I needed. The rest of Z wasn't considerably different, but you'll see the differences come as we go forward. As Goku and Vegeta train with Whis, on Earth, everyone else keeps training. The humans are motivated to become stronger and stronger. They still grow with Kaioken, and none of them end up becoming soft. As for Piccolo, sometime between the four years, he may have ended up fusing with Kami. Kami's getting a bit old, and through King Kai, they may be able to contact the Namekians to get some new Dragon Balls on Earth. And this is the best way for him to get stronger, so he ends up doing it. He becomes considerably stronger, and when the humans are in base, he surpasses all of them. Tension on pulls ahead. And since he'd be training with all the other humans, Krillin would probably end up learning Kaioken eventually. He would also be ahead of Piccolo in terms of power. And there is one more person that continues his training, that being Gohan. Goku was alive all those seven years, and now, everyone else on Earth is training too. There's no real reason for Gohan to stop. He'd most likely find that balance that he needs, and wanting to maintain the power that he got in the Buu Saga, he's more than motivated. Now, Ultimate itself is a very busted form. I plan to make a video about how great it is soon, because there's a lot of misconceptions that I see about it. So, side note, be on the lookout for that. But in the simplest terms, Gohan's gonna be a lot stronger here. He keeps the form, never loses it. He was stronger when he got it, and alongside all that, he keeps training. Seeing how strong he got in Dragon Ball Super, would it really be too surprising if Gohan keeps up with Goku and Vegeta just by using Ultimate? This is the path that he wants to go down, as he did in the original series, so he continues training with this. And it's great, even without Super Saiyan God, he's still able to keep up with everyone, as well as keeping his own unique form. And it's a good thing that he's keeping up his training, as well as everyone else, because not so long in the future, everyone will realize why their training was important. They'll need to defend against an incoming threat. Although most of its members are gone, the cooler force is still somewhat active, and they coordinate an attack on Earth. This time, they're going to get the Dragon Balls, aiming to revive Cooler. With the help of the Pilaf gang, they're eventually able to find the Dragon Balls. So, who should they actually revive? Well, Cooler seemed to be a more effective and stronger leader, but why not revive all three of them? It turned out that they have three wishes here. Oh, excuse me, they have two wishes. The Pilaf gang ends up stealing a wish. But Sorbet threatens to kill them and then he shoes them away. Damn! That would have been great, reviving Cooler, Frieza, and King Cold. But now they have to decide between two of them. Well, as the Cooler Force, the obvious pick is to revive Cooler. And they decide, maybe they should revive Frieza alongside him. In Hell, the three of them wait in their cocoons, all sharing a pretty similar personal Hell. Cooler then suddenly disappears, with Frieza and King Cold looking in shock. But then, Frieza disappears too. Oh, they may have gotten revived. King Cold patiently waits, grinning, waiting for his revival but he slowly comes to the realization that that's not happening. So, now bitter, he waits angrily in hell. Back in the living world, Cooler is pretty pissed. He's glad to be alive, but why revive Frieza with him? Grabbing Sorbet by the collar, he lifts him up, holding a beam to his face. While stammering, Sorbet tries to explain. They need all the power they can get, and although the brothers do hate each other, why don't they set their differences aside for this? Shouldn't they all hate the Earthlings? Well, Frieza doesn't really hate them as much as Cooler does. Sure, they're disgusting and there's some Saiyans there, but really, they killed Cooler, so he's pretty happy about that. Sorbet then reminds Frieza, didn't they meddle with Frieza's plan to get the Dragon Balls? Oh, that's actually a fair point. If they didn't meddle, Frieza would have gotten the Dragon Balls and Cooler would have never killed him. And as for Cooler, his gripe is pretty obvious. The two brothers have been at each other's necks in hell, but thankfully, they were trapped so they couldn't physically fight but they did annoy each other for years as King Cold just tried to ignore both of them, drowning out the noise. But now that they're free, they're gonna try to put their differences aside. But before that, there's something they wanna try. Frieza challenges Cooler to a fight. After all that smack talk in hell, they can finally attack each other physically rather than just verbally and mentally. Huh, Cooler's actually surprised to hear this. Does his brother really think he stands a chance? Of course, Cooler won't kill him this time. And you know what? He'll go a bit easy on him. Maybe it would be fun to get their frustrations out and fight. So, in space, the two eggs are their ship. They don't need any weird wasteland to fight in, no. All they need is the vacuum of space. They don't have to worry about destroying anything other than the ship. And they have a ton of great free space. 
From a distance, the two brothers stare at each other, then grin. They proceed to power up, amazing everyone on the ship. All the scouters explode, and as for those that can sense key, they're amazed. Of course, they knew the great power of these two before, but seeing it once again is still amazing. The two brothers finish powering up, with Cooler not even in his final form. Frieza chuckles, oh, his brother's underestimating him. Cooler scoffs at this, well, he did kill him before in his final form. This should be more than enough for the fight. Very well then. Screaming, the two then rocket towards each other, with a massive explosion occurring as their fists clash. At the very end of the last part, the two began a fight. After the two finish powering up, they fly towards each other, clashing. Frieza's fully transformed while Cooler isn't, and naturally, the two brothers are able to keep up with each other. But really, this fight is more so to get it out of each other's systems, and kind of to gauge where they are in terms of strength. They never really got to have a fun fight on Namek, that one was more so a quick death match. But this time, they're not out to kill each other. Naturally, Cooler would probably end up winning here, he's still stronger even without transforming. But this lets Frieza get a good idea of his power, and vice versa. But technically, this fight already does count as training. Dueling in the vacuum of space is good enough for them, so if they keep that up over the next few weeks or so, they'll be able to train and grow stronger. The only issue is the fact that they don't know how strong everyone on Earth is. Sure, the Saiyans are likely a lot stronger, but in terms of how much stronger, they're not too sure. They're not sure how long they'll have to train, but the good thing is because of their biology, they get to grow strong really quickly. And now, since the two of them have a good training partner, it's only going to make things even better for them. Frieza has a clear goal. He wants to reach a level like his brother's. A fifth transformation of sorts. He wants to become so strong that his final form becomes a suppressed level of power. But no, they need to go even further beyond that. Even though it means this will take more training, it's still worth it. They can't be too safe. It's better to be too strong than not strong enough. So, they begin going at it. A few weeks pass. Possibly even a few months. Both of them have grown a lot stronger. And they've actually figured out a new level of power for themselves. Frieza never ended up getting a form like Cooler. Instead, he went completely beyond that, obtaining his golden form, but he's not the only one. Of course, Cooler would unlock his own as well. The two were pretty set on this color. It really establishes their dominance. They think of it as a show of force of sorts, but the aesthetics aren't too important. What's important is the power behind the form. They've not only grown much stronger in base, but this form completely shoots them beyond that. For old time's sakes, why don't they have another fight? In their golden forms, the two head out into space once more, this time a lot further from the ship. They'll have to go all out this time. They want to make sure there'll be enough. The two begin powering up. Although they're incredibly far from Earth right now, their sheer power is enough for them to be sensed. Piccolo, Gohan, Goten, Trunks, everyone on Earth. They can sense something powerful in space. And as for those that saw Frieza and Cooler before, they recognize the power. Frieza and Cooler didn't even realize this. They just put everyone on high alert. But the question is, what are these two brothers planning? They definitely feel a lot stronger, but they don't seem to be near Earth at all. And from what they could sense, it seems like they're fighting each other? No one's really sure, but they're going to be cautious. Anywho, Frieza and Cooler continue their fight. They clash, and that alone is enough to destroy the planets around them. Out here in the vacuum of space, they don't need to worry about destroying anything, so key control's not an issue. They have no real regard for the environment around them. Shockwaves are sent through the entire galaxy, even the whole universe. The craziest part is, they're not even at maximum output yet. This is more so a warm-up. In short, they're definitely content with their new level of power. This should be enough for them to get their revenge. And with that, they set out on their expedition towards Earth, ready to attack. Everyone on Earth senses the two brothers powering down, no longer being able to detect them. Did they kill each other, or did they just calm down? No one's too sure, but they don't want to take any chances. They decide it might be best to contact Goku and Vegeta on Beerus' planet, but they can't really figure out a way to do that. Plus, everyone's split up right now, so they decide to meet and come up with a plan, just in case those two show up. Of course, on Beerus' planet, everyone did sense what was happening. But Goku and Vegeta aren't too worried. Once Frieza and Cooler show up, they'll head to Earth and stop them. And even so, maybe the Earthlings might be enough, specifically Gohan. They're ready to act just in case, but they're not too concerned. A short amount of time passes, when suddenly a few ships enter Earth's atmosphere. And now that everyone's closer, they can of course be sensed. Gohan, Piccolo, Krillin, and all the other Z-Fighters are ready. They expected this, but not so soon. Bulma begins trying to contact Whis as everyone heads over. They're greeted with a very small army, and the army's pretty weak. Much like usual, the soldiers aren't too much to take on. The Z fighters are able to defeat them pretty easily, and they're wondering where the main course is. They can sense Frieza and Cooler, but they haven't stepped out of the ship yet. But then, a door on one of the ships opens. Two figures walk out, Cooler and Frieza in his final form, looking much different than they remember. And honestly, they're a bit confused too. Why are they even teamed up? They thought they were fighting before, Cooler even killed Frieza. 
Well, the two explain. They put their differences aside and realize that they have a common enemy. They are brothers after all, so why not get along? Despite the fact that they still do have disdain for each other, it's kind of an enemy of my enemy situation. Gohan steps up first, ready to fight. Cooler and Frieza look at each other and laugh, as Cooler then steps up. Gohan tells Cooler not to play around, telling him to transform. This Saiyan definitely seems very confident, so Cooler plays along with it. He goes into his final form, and surprisingly, Gohan doesn't seem too concerned about it. Well, just as he expected though, it's only natural that some of the Earthlings got stronger. His final form might not cut it anymore, but it's a good thing that this isn't his true final form. He and Gohan begin fighting. Gohan's actually holding back here, and he's more than enough to face final form Cooler. Frieza watches on, confused, but also a bit interested. Huh, these monkeys definitely did get a bit stronger. They would have never been able to take on Cooler in this form before. And while Cooler fights Gohan, the rest of the humans and Piccolo end up fighting Frieza. After the humans train with King Kai, they are a lot stronger. And with a combined effort from all the Z fighters, it is enough to hold them off, even in this final form. Okay, so they've obviously had their fun, and they've been able to gauge the power of everyone on Earth. As they expected, their final form still wasn't enough, so they'll have to go beyond that into their new golden form. The two draw back from the fight, and they begin powering up. A golden aura coats them, almost as if their entire body hardens and turns into literal gold. In terms of their body shape, they don't look too different, but the new golden shine that they have is a clear giveaway that they've transformed. Of course, everyone can sense the power too. It's amazing, but at the same time terrifying. They know this power will be used for bad. They're still waiting for Goku and Vegeta to arrive. By now, Whis would have gotten the message, but they can't teleport here. They have to take a ride with Whis, which is gonna take a few minutes. Until then, they're gonna have to try and fight off these two brothers. Gohan immediately goes for Frieza, and with Ultimate at full power, he actually probably would overpower Frieza at this point. But that's the thing. He overpowers Frieza and only Frieza. There's two people there that he's facing, not just one. He could also probably take on Cooler alone, but since there's two of them there, that's not gonna happen. And that's why it's a great idea that they teamed up. Had they not, Gohan would've essentially screwed them over right from the get-go. He and the Z Fighters go into full defensive mode. Right now, they know they can't win, so they'll just have to buy time. But surprisingly, Gohan's able to notice some flaws. Despite them being a lot more powerful, it seems that they're having a tough time controlling their power. After a couple minutes of using their maximum power, both Frieza and Cooler seem a little tired out. Not very tired, but it seems like they have strained themselves a bit. They'll just have to stall Frieza and Cooler until Goku and Vegeta get here, and those two will definitely be enough. By then, their stamina would have worn out quite a bit more, and not to mention, their power will be very helpful, obviously. The two are still split up now, but Frieza eventually realizes. Gohan's gotten a lot more defensive. Rather than focusing on attacking Frieza and Cooler, he's defending himself, as are everyone else. Frieza puts two and two together and realizes that they're stalling for time. It must be those other two monkeys that they're waiting for, so Frieza and Cooler begin picking up the pace, attacking more seriously and together, rather than their somewhat individual fighting style. Their first target is Gohan. The two brothers attack him, easily being able to take him out. Gohan's knocked to the ground, nearly unconscious. He looks up and he sees the two brothers aiming their fingers at him. They laugh maniacally and quickly charge Blast, firing two massive beams together towards Gohan. He tries to counter with a Kamehameha, but his beam slowly is getting overpowered. The two even put more energy into it. The beam gets closer and closer to Gohan, but suddenly, his beam gets larger and completely overpowers the two blasts easily, hurting the two brothers as they're hit by the Kamehameha. Gohan's confused, but once the smoke settles, he sees next to him, Goku and Vegeta. Since Frieza and Cooler did arrive a bit earlier, Goku and Vegeta aren't as experienced with Blue as they were originally. They still do have blue, but for now they're going to be fighting a Super Saiyan God since it is way more reliable for them. They help Gohan up as Frieza and Cooler look in anger, injured from the blast. The two realize now that they might be overpowered and outnumbered, but they still do have an ace up their sleeve. The two lift their hands in the air, and quickly, they both create a giant ball of energy together. It grows larger and larger, the entire sky turns orange. The ocean nearby begins steaming, evaporating from the heat. It's too much, and together, the two brothers fling their hands forward as the massive ball of energy gets closer and closer to the ground. Gohan, Vegeta, and Goku all fire blast together. As Frieza and Cooler keep pushing, the rest of the Z Fighters join in too. If this blast touches Earth, it's done. They need more power to push this back. Goku and Vegeta were saving this, thinking that they wouldn't need it, but it seems like it's the right time for it. Together, they coat themselves in a blue aura, with their hair shifting from a reddish hue to a bluish one. And just as they do this, the blast is suddenly overpowered. Frieza and Cooler can't even brace themselves for it. They try pushing the ball back, but they can't. With one last push, Vegeta and Goku release more energy, and together, Frieza and Cooler are incinerated by their own blast, as it's launched off into space, dissipating safely away from Earth. All the combined beams stop being fired. 
with everyone powered down, both a little worn out and relieved. Thank Kami, Goku, and Vegeta came in the nick of time, otherwise Earth may have been doomed. They're amazed at how strong Cooler and Frieza got in such a short period of time. It would have been great if they had a way to stop them earlier, but sadly there wasn't. The Dragon Balls were already used, presumably by the Frieza Force, so they couldn't even try and get those to try and wish for something. But hey, it's all over and it went well. And that's really all that matters for now. So, as I mentioned in the last part, this what if is about Cooler, and I do want to keep it that way. And since he died again, we're going to skip through the next few arcs, but the series doesn't end here. I'm sure you know what I'm hinting at, but we'll save that for the end of this video. It is a bit important to cover the next two arcs, but we're going to speed through them kind of. Next up, there would definitely be the Universe 6 tournament. And in terms of the tournament, things would probably go relatively normal. An obvious difference would be Gohan would be there instead of Boo, because there is no Boo. With Ultimate, he's a lot stronger in the scenario, and he has been training. Pretty much on the level of Goku and Vegeta, so he's an incredibly important addition to the team. Other than that, the rest of the team stays the same. Goku, Vegeta, Piccolo, and yes, even Monaka. And the tournament itself is actually pretty easy. Really, the only speed bump that they face is hit. Goku would most likely still unlock Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken, tripping hit up and then eventually finishing the fight on good terms, causing hit to later forfeit as well. All pretty normal. And with that arc going pretty much the same, that means the future Trunks arc would go the same too. The only real difference I could think of is Goku and Vegeta finding out about fusion for the first time. As discussed in the last part, they didn't know about either forms of it, whether it be the fusion dance or Patara. But they would see what Zamasu and Goku Black do, and Gawasu would tell them about fusion. The great thing is, they know it's not permanent now. So Vegeta doesn't need any convincing, the two fuse into Vegito, and that fight goes pretty much the same. And that's really the only difference for that arc, everything else goes pretty much the same. Cooler being in the scenario and everything that happened in Z wouldn't change too much. At least, not until the Tournament of Power. This would naturally come up in conversation later on, as Zeno decides he wants to try it out after seeing the Universe 6 tournament. And now, Goku's tasked with finding 10 people for his universe to fight. Okay, so there's some pretty big changes here. For one, the humans are stronger, so Yamcha actually gets to be on the team. This also means Krillin and Tenshinhan will be very useful. Sadly, Roshi's probably most likely at the same strength. But hey, he got onto the team in the first place, so he's here again. That's great and all that Yamcha's on, but there's two people that they're going to be missing. The androids won't be in the tournament, due to what happened to them. Obviously, they can't be considered because they're not even alive here. Okay, so while they did get an additional member, they also lost another. This would mean they're short by two people. They considered putting Goten and Trunks in, but obviously they're not too keen on that idea. In comparison to everyone else, they're not necessarily too strong, and they lack a lot of experience. As a last resort, they could put those two in the team, but Goku then gets an idea. Why not revive someone to help? What is he talking about? Well, they have two perfectly good fighters that they can recruit, two people that are strong and experienced, although they have a bad kind of experience. They don't know what Goku's referring to, but then he says it. He's considering recruiting Frieza and Cooler. They think he's insane, but he's able to talk them into it. Worst case scenario, Beerus can just erase them if they act up, and they'll just put Goten and Trunks on there. He begs everyone to recruit them. It's at least worth a shot. They are powerful, and they could be a really big help. It takes some convincing, but eventually, everyone agrees. They don't really have any other choice, and Goku's very stubborn about it. Baba's also pretty wary, but she allows it. And Goku ends up going to hell, literally, but just for a visit. He ends up in a really odd place, the personal hell for Frieza, Cooler, and King Cold. Although this time, they're all split up so they can't argue with each other. Goku frees Frieza and Cooler from their cocoons. I can't believe I nailed that tongue twister. King Cold gets excited. Is he finally going to be freed too? It seems like his sons are getting revived again. Maybe this will be his chance to escape hell. But then out of nowhere, Goku just leaves with Cooler and Frieza. They don't even look towards him. King Cold patiently waits until he realizes, yeah, he's going to be stuck here again. This guy can just not catch a break. He screams, but no one's there to hear him. Damn, that's kind of messed up. Anywho, after Frieza, Cooler, and Goku all fight each other, they arrive back in the living world bruised and beaten. And of course, there would be an assassination attempt on both Frieza and Cooler. But with a lot of brutality, they're easily able to stop this even nearly killing Goku in the process. But Goku's intrigued. These two definitely seem stronger, even though they didn't really get to train in Hell. They've trained their minds instead. And just as Frieza has, both of them have unlocked the true golden form. Essentially the same thing, except this time, they actually have control over the stamina it uses. There's more to training than just training your body. And you know what? Before the tournament, Goku kind of wants to test this power. He's not even sure if he could fight both of them at once. He made it to do this one-on-one. -on -one. He proposes the offer for a fight, and they're interested as well. Maybe it'll help them get some bad things out of their system. Beating up Goku could be good for them mentally. Goku's pumped up, and the two give him an evil grin. Baba and the Ghost Hunter are hot, terrified of what's about to happen, with Beerus and Whis even arriving to watch what's going on. The last part ended with Goku reviving Cooler and Frieza. 
ready to have them join the tournament, but beforehand, he does want to test their power once more. A fight might be beneficial for them. It's not going to be 2v1 though, Vegeta joins in, beating Goku once Baba brings them all back. They're ready to fight until a certain group approaches. Assassins have been sent from Universe 9 to kill them, although they're not too big of a threat. Until one of them pulls out God of Destruction energy, throwing it towards the scariest looking fighter there, Cooler. He's seemingly caught in this, but then gets an idea. He takes control of it, and it seems like the Kai completely disappears. As if he negated it somehow, kind of like how Frieza did when he threw it at Goku. But Cooler does something different. Instead of disposing of it, he decides to keep it, storing it for later much like the assassin was able to do. Oh yeah, and he kills that assassin. And now, they can all fight. No fusing or killing, it'll be 1v1 for each person. Goku faces Cooler, while Vegeta faces Frieza. And even though these two were stuck in hell, Goku and Vegeta are surprised to see how strong they are. They've gotten a better control over Golden, and seem to be stronger overall, but they weren't the only ones that got stronger, obviously. The fight impresses both Goku and Vegeta, and shows that these two are about on par with each other now. Frieza is kind of a mutant after all, and is finally caught up to his brother. And the two together are equal to Goku and Vegeta. This is kind of scary because of how strong they are, but also good because they'll be valuable for the team. Cooler begins scheming though. With this energy, he can do anything he wants. He can kill either Goku or Vegeta during the tournament, or afterwards. He starts to think of what he could use it for, as they're all escorted towards the tournament. When it begins, Frieza and Cooler go off on their own, as Gohan tries but fails to keep everyone together. And before the tournament, they met someone that got them interested, that being Frost. Frost is surprised to see two other people that are just like him, and he feels that all of them have some sort of unspoken alliance. The three of them all hang out, until Frieza and Cooler gang up on him, beating him up just for fun. So why do they do this? Well, they just do it for fun, <laughs> no real reason. And they fling him out of the ring. But he's not the only member of the sixth universe that they're interested in. No, they see the Saiyans there too, and you know how they feel about Saiyans. So as easy prey, they attack the three Saiyans there. This causes Kale to go berserk, and they're still able to fight her pretty simply. But Kaba and Kalifa can tell that this is getting bad. So Kaba comes up with a good idea. Kalifa puts on one of the Batara earrings, while Kaba goes in to put the other on Kale. In her rage, she knocks Kaba out of the ring, but he's successfully able to put the earring on her, forcing her into fusing with Kalifa. Of course, the two brothers aren't too surprised, they've seen fusion before. This one has green hair though, which is a bit weird. But hey, they're used to color changing monkeys. So together, the two go golden, as Kefla powers up too. This happens pretty early on in the first big fight of the tournament. And since the two brothers haven't used much energy, and they're not beat up at all, Fighting Kefla isn't as hard as you'd expect. If anything, this is a great way for them to show their power. During the fight, Frieza appears behind Kefla, taking her earrings off, hoping that it'll cause a defusion. But they're still stuck like this for another few minutes. No big deal, Cooler and Frieza both knock Kefla out together. And as an added bonus, Frieza now has something very special. He has Patara earrings. These may come in handy eventually. For the time being, they'll deal with some other random fighters. Right now, Goku and Vegeta are busy defeating Universe 2 alongside everyone else. But then Frieza and Cooler are stopped by two people. Of course, Frieza and Cooler are villains here, and someone would pick up on that, that being Topo, so he and Dispo step in to stop them. They are fighting on the side of justice after all, and what better thing to do than stop these two menaces? Topo's the main threat as Dispo runs around them, trying to mess them up by outspeeding them. While they're in Golden, his hits don't really hurt, and even though he may be fast, they have a way to stop him. At one point, he tries to run past Frieza, to which Frieza responds by sticking his tail out, grabbing Dispo's leg. Dispo face plants onto the ground as Frieza picks him up, while Cooler tries to hold off Topo. With a long barrage of lasers, Frieza keeps rapid firing them at Dispo, as he's then flung off the side of the stage, and now that means the two brothers can face Topo together. He doesn't even get a chance to transform. The two of them completely overwhelm Topo as he tries to stay in. They do take some heavy hits, and as Topo powers up further, he becomes more of an issue, and although they're hesitant about helping, two people step in to help the brothers. Combined, two Masenkos are shot at Topo catching him off guard and throwing him out of the ring. Gohan and Piccolo have stepped in, stealing the elimination. They're already kind of wary of Frieza and Cooler. They do kind of want to make sure these two don't get MVP, which means they have to get as many eliminations as possible, and Frieza and Cooler already have a bunch. But as long as even one person in Universe 7 stays ahead, they'll keep those two from getting the wish. The roster of fighters still in the ring dwindles. Goku still hasn't gone Ultra Instinct, and likely Vegeta wouldn't have Super Saiyan Blue Evolution. They would be facing Jiren at this point, but nothing would have pushed them over the edge yet. Jiren is clearly the main threat now, but once Topo and Dispo are fought, this catches Jiren's attention. He's not going there to avenge Topo and Dispo or anything, but rather to get rid of these two pests. They are clearly not good people, and just like them, he's going to serve justice. 
He knocks Goku and Vegeta away into a nearby rock, as he then jumps over to where Cooler and Frieza are. At least those other fighters were honorable, these two aren't. He'll face them alone, and he'll do it easily. The two try and face Jiren, but they're very overwhelmed. And this gets Goku and Vegeta to realize, maybe if they all gang up on Jiren together, they can defeat him. So, they jump in to help Cooler and Frieza, with Gohan and Piccolo jumping in as well. With most of the fighters from other universes already finished off, it's basically those remaining Universe 7 fighters versus Jiren. And even with everyone working together, it's abundantly clear that Jiren is far too strong for anyone. Cooler tries to do what Frieza did, grabbing Jiren's leg with his tail trying to trip him. But Jiren's unfazed by this and uses this to grab Cooler, beating him up. And while Jiren's distracted by this, Frieza decides to create a cage around both of them. But of course Jiren notices this and jumps out of it, being basically unfazed by the lasers as he jumps towards Frieza, focusing all his attention on that guy. The others try and fight him, but with one hand, he holds them off, while with the other hand, he fights Frieza. And they notice how set he is on defeating Frieza first. Specifically, Cooler picks up on this. And he has a great idea. Covertly, he pulls out the Hakai energy that he stored before, charging in his hands. He tells everyone to stand back, as he then quickly uses an eye laser to carve out some of the ring, without Jiren noticing. Now with Jiren and Frieza floating on basically a giant rock, Cooler throws the Hakai at it, destroying the ground below them. Both of them are shocked by this, especially Frieza. Why'd Cooler do that? Well, it doesn't matter. This is their shot to eliminate Jiren. So as he falls off the ring, everyone attacks him at once, trying to prevent him from coming back up with his own Ki Blast. And with this, Jiren is eliminated. There's only some fodder still left in the ring. But this is kind of bad. Cooler's a contender for MVP. He just defeated one of the strongest fighters, or at least helped defeat him. Cooler laughs, knowing that he'll get the Super Dragon Balls. Everyone else tries to catch up, eliminating the other fighters trying to give the elimination to Vegeta because he has the most so far besides Cooler. Eventually, it comes down to only one group of fighters left, the Trio of Danger. They're able to stick it out this long, and they know that this might be their end. The Trio tries to fight Cooler, but Cooler takes out Lavender and Basil. But thankfully, Lavender poisons Cooler before he's defeated. Bergamo's still in, and he's grown a lot stronger and bigger from all of Cooler's attacks, but he's worried that he'll fall out of the ring if this goes on for any longer. Even with the poison, Cooler is still about to win. He has the advantage over Bergamo regardless of his power now. And the Saiyans don't want to take the chance. With Bergamo confused, they team up with him, explaining why they're helping. He's not really too sure why they want to knock out their own fighter, but whatever. They spend their time protecting Bergamo, as they all face Cooler. And this is an issue for him. He's poisoned, and he's being attacked by a bunch of strong fighters at once. All he has to do is knock out Bergamo, but he's not able to. As the poison ravages through his body, He's then knocked out by Vegeta, meaning Bergamo's the only opposition, and he knows they all plan to revive the universes, so he's fine with taking the fall, and apologizes for judging them before. Vegeta taps him on the shoulder, as Bergamo then jumps out of the ring, causing Vegeta to get the illumination, meaning he's the MVP and gets the Super Dragon Balls. A wish is made to restore every universe, putting things back to normal, and because of how they acted during the tournament, everyone decides that it's best not to revive Cooler and Frieza. I mean, clearly after the way they acted, that would be a terrible idea. And naturally, the two are angered by this, although they still have some time left in the living world, and they actually have kind of a good idea of what to do now. They decide to give it one last shot at attacking Earth, before they're sent to hell forever. These two never learn. They don't need Broly or any other strong fighter to help them. They have just what they need already. Once everyone arrives back on Earth, before Frieza and Cooler are taken away, Frieza pulls out something that he got during the tournament, Patara earrings. He tells Cooler to put one on as he puts on another. Surprising everyone as out of nowhere, those two fuse. As you'd probably guess, a fusion between Cooler and Frieza is pretty strong. The insane power of these two added together and multiplied by many times. Not to mention the fact that he has his true golden form. And even better, since he's still dead, he's gonna have the same benefits that Goku did during the Buu Saga. So he won't get tired out either. Immediately as they fuse, the fusion turns golden. Introducing himself as Golden Kuliza. This is their strongest and final attempt at revenge. Thankfully, Whis just healed everyone, so Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan, the strongest fighters there, are ready to go, jumping in to fight the new fusion. Although, that was just good timing. Beerus and Whis aren't going to help them otherwise. And what's worse, they can't find a way to fuse. There's no opportunity for them to get Patara of their own, so they're going to have to fight unfused. Unsure if they can even accomplish that. Kuliza could blow up Earth right away, but where's the fun in that? He knows he's stronger than everyone here by a long shot, so he's going to enjoy himself for a bit. Everyone tries to face him, but it's still too much. And he decides first he's going to finish off Goku and Vegeta. With all five fingers outstretched, he shoots another machine gun barrage of death beams at them. They're able to barely defend it, getting pretty injured by it but not mortally injured. 
and with one finger, he charges a golden death ball, throwing it right at them. The other fighters watch on in disbelief as Goku and Vegeta are seemingly killed. This angers Gohan, giving him a temporary rage boost as he jumps in trying to fight the fusion. But even with how strong he is in this scenario, and with the rage boost, it won't be enough to take down Kuliza, but at least, it serves as a good distraction. He tries to fight the fusion, but is then swatted away, as Kuliza then prepares to kill him with another death beam. Gohan looks up as the beam is charged in his face, but then notices something weird standing nearby. Goku and Vegeta, they're alive. Although something about them is different, it kind of looks like they're in their base, but with a weird change. The attack didn't explode and kill them, no, they nullified it. They were only barely able to survive, and actually, it served as a catalyst for them, allowing them to access a new realm of power, Ultra Instinct. Yes, both of them got Ultra Instinct from this. They're not too sure what it is, nor are Beerus and Whis until they theorize a bit, and they realize it's Ultra Instinct after they see them dodge a bunch of death beams from Kuliza. The fusion keeps trying to attack them, but they just dodge. Every time they're attacked, they evade it easily, almost as if they're not even thinking about it. The two barely have control over this power, but they're going to make the most of it. They rush Kuliza, hitting him with a flurry of attacks, as he tries to hit back but can't. Angered, he charges a bunch of key in his hand, focusing on trying to hit Vegeta with it. Vegeta easily dodges all the punches, and while this happens, Goku grabs onto his tail from behind, spinning Kuliza around, throwing him up into the air. With great speed, he gets in front of Kuliza, hitting him with a strong Kamehameha. This flings the fusion farther away, as he's then kicked back by Goku once more. With smoke coming off him, he falls down towards the ground, as Vegeta charges a final flash, and Goku charging another Kamehameha. Using the last of their energy, they jump up high in the air, launching these attacks together towards the fusion. Coolies a shout as he's erased by the attack, as he's killed by it. And since he was already dead, this means he's erased forever. No matter what, he can't be brought back to life. Goku and Vegeta drop out of Ultra Instinct, but now have a new path of power to pursue. They're not too surprised with what happened with those brothers, but hey, at least they won the tournament and got something out of it afterwards. Funny enough, it seems like King Cold lucked out here. While he never got revived, he's patiently waiting in hell for his sons to return, and they never do. And you know what? He's kind of happy about it in a way. He never really cared for them, and since he never got a chance to be revived, they kind of deserve this. I mean, yeah, he's stuck in hell for eternity, but at least he keeps his soul. They're just gone for good. So I could continue this series into the Moro arc, but first of all, we do know that they're going to be fine regardless. And second of all, like I mentioned in the last few parts, there's no point in covering the scenario if there's no Cooler involved. And now since Cooler and Frieza are dead forever, well it wouldn't really be a what if about Cooler if he's not here. And he'll never be here again. So, I guess that means that this is the end of the scenario. Let's end off here for now. So, what did you guys think about this part? And what did you think of the scenario as a whole? Would you actually like to see Cooler appear in canon sometime soon? Either in a new arc or a new movie even? Leave any thoughts or suggestions in the comments below. I'll be sure to check them all out to see what you guys think. As always, if you liked the video, be sure to drop a like, and let's try to hit that like goal from the beginning of the video. If you haven't already, why not subscribe, as well as hitting the bell icon to get notified about any future videos that I upload on my channel, including more like this one. And with all that done, thank you all for watching, thank you all for supporting this series, and I'll see you all in my next video.